Tonight, we're here for an important presentation on the sovereignty issues facing the peoples of tribal nations who live within the geography of the United States. And they are subject to the laws of individual states. Serious issues arise as a result of the 2020 decision by the United States Supreme Court in McGirt versus Oklahoma. To explain the consequences of this court decision, the Henry George School welcomes the head of the Department of History at Oklahoma State University, Professor Brian Hosmer. Professor Hosmer has four decades of experience studying and writing about the issues facing the tribal nations of North America. He'll share with us his concerns raised by this court decision and the profound effects on the economies of the First Nations and their people. As co-founder and chair of the Oklahoma Indigenous Studies Alliance, he is in a unique position to explain to those of us who live outside the tribal system the challenges still faced by the people we describe as indigenous, as first Americans, or as American Indians. Brian will take questions and comments during the presentation, should you have them, but please use the reaction function for Zoom and raise your yellow hand and we will recognize you. And please try to keep your questions or comments short so that Brian can get through his presentation uh, within the appropriate amount of time. So Brian, with that, I turn uh, the program over to you and we're all looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and I'm delighted to see uh, a good number of people showing up for this talk. Uh, I should say that that uh, I'm really interested and excited about being here with the Henry George School of Social Sciences. I'm uh, a fan from a distance and remember uh, many decades ago learning about Henry George right as I was a student and being intrigued and I return a little bit to it periodically as I try to contemplate my own sort of periodic excursions into questions of taxation in the context of an equitable political economy. And so these things are really interesting. And it seems to me that that some of what tribal nations have explored over the last generation and more really speak to some of these larger concerns. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of what I know about uh, McGurk, even more broadly, my thoughts on uh, Indian nations and tribal economies and political economy with you. So with that, let me see if I can share my screen and get right to things here. And how are we? See everything okay? Yes? Yep. Okay, good. All right. Well, then, then, then here we go. And so and you can see, I, I'll talk to you a little bit about the map on the right at some point, and then the the photograph across the um, on the left hand side has some some importance to this conversation as well. But we'll come back to that a little bit. Um, let's see, why are we? There we go. So we're going to start here. So on April thirteenth, twenty twenty two, the United States District Court for the Northern District in Oklahoma handed down a ruling in a case called Hooper versus the City of Tulsa. Little noted at the time, uh, even in Tulsa, although a subject of considerable conversation. Now, this decision supported the city of Tulsa's motion to dismiss an appeal to a conviction for a speeding ticket issued in 2018. The plaintiff, Justin Hooper, and you see him represented here, argued that the city of Tulsa, which assessed this $150 fine, lacked the authority to do so because he... Hooper is a member of the Choctaw Nation, and the traffic violation took place inside Tulsa city limits, which is located within the boundaries of the Muskogee Creek Nation. Grossly simplified, Hooper's position turned on an interpretation of a pre-statehood act from 1898, which governed the application of municipal law to citizens of Indian nations within Indian territory, and threw into question the authority of municipal courts over members of tribal nations. Now, Hooper never denied he was speeding, uh, always agreed that that happened. He just said that the city had no jurisdiction over him. For my purposes, the Hooper case and then where I'm going really speaks to this. The key context is McGirt versus Oklahoma. And there's and the, the one on the right we'll talk a little bit on just in a second. It's the 2020 Supreme Court ruling which established the unbroken sovereignty of the Muscogee Creek Nation 
and was extended subsequently to the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations, the remaining four of the so-termed five civilized tribes forcibly removed from the American South to what became Oklahoma in the 1830s and 40s. From there, the ruling's reach has gradually expanded to far northeast Oklahoma to the Quapaw Reservation uh, near the Missouri border and then to neighboring Peoria and Ottawa reservations, which courts found in 2023 had never been disestablished. And that's Oklahoma versus Brester. That's the case on the right. The Supreme Court, the, the McGirt, McGirt ruling was a blockbuster and that the United States Supreme Court affirmed Muscogee Creek jurisdiction over criminal cases involving a citizen of a tribal nation when that crime took place on sovereign tribal territory. In rendering the ruling, the court affirmed that the, the constitutional principle that only the United States Congress could erase tribal sovereignty where it had been recognized through treaty or other mechanisms, and it had to do so directly and specifically generally speaking, through legislative action. This countered the state's claim that the operations of colonialism, of history, of dispossession, had effectively disestablished the Muscogee Creek Reservation. The ruling hewed closely to the law, even as it came, to a shock, came as a shock to many white Oklahomans. It also referenced the force of history and again law, as Justice Gorsuch wrote in his memorable opening lines to the ruling on the far end of the trail of tears, there was a promise. And that promise was abiding by the rule of law where government negotiated and ratified treaties meant something. So back to Hooper for just a second, and then we'll come back to him later on in this talk. What's interesting about that case is how Jordan Hooper's attorneys sought to extend McGirt to municipal questions, questions of municipal jurisdiction, tried to, sought to move it in a slightly different direction. The court disagreed and ruled that, quote, McGirt makes no mention of municipal jurisdiction and does not deal with municipal law at all. I find this case, and here's just a map of, gives you a sense of what we're talking about in the removals from the 19th century and where people are located. Tulsa is like right around there, just to let you know sort of where some of these places are. I find this case interesting, partly for the predictably fevered reception from state political leaders, city leaders, businesses, commercial interests. Separately and in concert, they fanned the flames of paranoia and fear, telling Oklahomans that left unchecked, McGirt will have violent criminals roaming the streets, personal property confiscated, by unaccountable tribal authorities and the reduction with the reduction of non-Indians to a kind of second-class citizenship. That particular claim tells me that irony is truly dead in Oklahoma. We think about historically what second-class citizenship meant. Our governor on the left here is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, but a claim that the tribe disputes, but he claims he is a Cherokee. citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And, and Governor Stitt is a leading purveyor of these delusions, which are regularly repeated and amplified in news reports and op-eds, letters to media outlets, and the like. The government governor's toxic political commercials raise the specter of these nefarious casino bosses, casino bosses seeking to undermine his, at least in, in, in contrast, principled leadership. And in this sense, references very old arguments about corrupt Indian governments mismanaging funds and easy prey for the unscrupulous. I should mention that the governor persists in this. This is from 2020 at a state of the state address just last week with tribal chairman present. Governors did denounce McGirt as a matter of an, a matter of, uh, an unlawful race preference and a ruling that divided Oklahomans uh, according to race and elevated some rights over others. That claim is patently untrue, a misreading of both McGirt and the U.S. Constitution, but no matter, such is the discourse that sur surrounds tribal sovereignty in places like Oklahoma. While Governor Stitt, and this is a response from the tribes in terms of straight compacts, 
I'll come back. I will stay here with it. It's a good one right there. Well, Governor Stitt postures as an everyman who is committed to equal rights for all Oklahomans as opposed to special rights, as opposed to special rights for tribal nations, I gather. The nations have proven to be resourceful and sophisticated and powerful adversaries. Excuse me just a moment. Sorry about that. Powerful um, uh, adversaries, equally adept at defining their position in universalist terms. A 2021 dispute over renewal, a renewal of gaming compacts mandated by federal law had Stitt trying to pit tribal nations against one another in order to assist the governor in his drive to unilaterally renegotiate gaming compacts. I can come back to you and talk about compacts if you want, but let's keep moving. But in this case, Principal Chief Chuck Hoskins of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma objected strenuously and publicly denounced the governor and his lackeys. No federal official can give Governor Stitt the authority he needed to legally bind the state to these compacts. And he predicted months and years of continuing lit litigation and I hardly see, he said, how this win, this equals a win for the state of Oklahoma. As importantly, a consolidated effort by a group called United for Oklahoma, representing numerous Oklahoma tribal nations, entered the public discussion. Through a series of television and print and social media spots, it sought to educate the general public to the tangible benefits brought by tribal enterprise and by extension, tribal sovereignty itself. This campaign stressed the nation's commitment to the general welfare and advancement of the state for all Oklahomans. In a series of television and internet spots, oh, uh, the, the United for Oklahoma positioned itself and themselves as responsible tribal governments uh, for all Oklahomans. As the impasse, we'll come back to this. No, well, this is fine. As this impasse left millions in revenues already factored into the state budget, languishing in escrow accounts, the dimensions of the struggle became apparent and with this a clear indication of a shifting balance of power amidst ongoing risk. To seal the deal, courts supported the law delivering the tribes a victory in this latest high stakes battle. So Stitt attempted to renegotiate the, the gaming compacts. The tribes went to the courts and the tribes won. This was one of many victories the tribes had in this period of time. But the struggle continues as the governor and his allies continue to spread fear, hoping for victories in courts, the state legislature, and the ballot box. And an interesting side note to this, in the 2020 governor election, tribes broke with tradition, and they endorsed Stitt's opponent. Now, she didn't win, but the effort seems not to have damaged the tribe's position in Oklahoma generally, which I think is a really important point. So my goal this afternoon and this evening is not so much to deep dig deeper into McGirt, but I want to consider it in the context of the evolving influence of tribal nations placed next to scholarship about indigenous economic development. I suggest that external assessments of indigenous enterprise were and are culturally conditioned, thus influencing how non-Indian scholars and observers evaluate the structure of tribal economies. And these, these assumptions build upon notions about indigenous people as economic actors or not. It is a complicated conversation that is deeply rooted in notions about relationships between uh, culture and economy that often marginalize indigenous histories and essentialize uh, uh, indigenous cultures. i come back here. Maybe where do I want to be on this one? This is some basic stuff. I want to come back to these later, but we'll come back here. That indigenous peoples and communities are both subjects of and actors in the unfolding of their lives and economies in the centuries following context speaks to another goal for this paper. Here, I'm interested in understanding how tribal people have adjusted to capitalist marketplaces, again through the agents, ages, and with the emergence of vibrant economies across Indian country. In this regard, what particularly interests me are the evolving sets of relationships between tribes 
and Oklahoma that illustrate how tribal financial muscle translates to political power. It's an Oklahoma story deeply rooted in our origins as Indian territory and given shape by the highly contested and disputed dissolution of tribal nations in the at the onset of the 20th century. This is a place, I'll give you a little bit of a primer here, tribal sovereignty, these, these court cases establish the position of tribes uh, in constitutional position. The trust doctrine is a relationship and a set of obligations between the federal government and the tribes. Legal and constitutional standing of indigenous nations are established and confirmed by treaties defined as nation to nation agreements. Some basic things. Treaty rights incorrectly represented as giving tribes special rights when in fact they are constitutionally backed guarantees defined in treaties. Indian, Indian nations are not given lands or rights by the U.S. Instead, tribal leaders reserved lands and rights their nations already possessed when engaging in treating agreements. And the Supreme Court ruled right in 1905, really critically, the treaty was not a grant of rights to Indians, but a grant of rights from them. And I think that's a really critical piece. And these are some of the pieces here that I may come back, but really one of the, so these are the critical pieces of legislation that essentially structure and define some of the ways that these tribal nations and, the, and, the, and are, are interacting with state governments and the federal government. So this story that I'm really interested in is, is one of relationships, one of a set of things, two, some, a couple of different things happening simultaneously. We place action, we're placing actions of indigenous individuals and nations in conversation with developments and scholarship. I'm referring on the one hand to the dramatic growth of economics, labor and capitalism as important analytical frameworks. These threads interweave for me through temporal proximity where scholarly developments focused on tribal engagements with marketplaces overlapped in time with a genuine revolution in tribal national enterprise. I'm interested in how these things are happening at the same time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about scholarship and I'm gonna come back to Oklahoma in just a moment. So nearly three decades ago, my advisor and first mentor, Jack Sunder, handed me a pirated copy of this book that I have on here, uh, here listed here or shown here, Rolf Knight's Indians at Work, an informal history of native Indian labor in British Columbia, 1858 to 1930. I'm sure all of you have read it and have it on your bookshelves. Published in 1978 and just as soon forgotten, the book became a cornerstone for a new scholarship overturning an existing narrative that had largely ignored indigenous laboring. Indeed, scholarly convention at the time amplified more general perceptions about indigenous political economy as collapsing under the weight of American expansion, the expropriation of resources and land, ultimately leading to marginalization and replacement. While I've worked with these ideas for decades and pushed back against them, I'm newly inspired by the many critiques of our neoliberal consensus that emerged following the 2008-2009 financial crisis and reappeared during the global pandemic. The scholarship is well known to you, includes a whole raft of popular titles that engage poverty and inequality, the role of global finance, the rise of extremism, the suppression uh, of critiques, perhaps even uh, implicating the neoliberal order as manifested in liberal democracies in Europe, North America, and India, at least for a while. And significantly and germane to the purpose of this paper, these examinations of capitalism overlapped in time with mass protests that for a brief moment implicated neoliberalism in a broader set of social conversations. And so these things, right, scholarship and things happening on the ground, right, coinciding in our time as well. And here are some other, right, relations to this. And, the, and related as well, right, to a series of books that were really speaking about sort of the sort of new histories of capitalism that I find interesting and intriguing and instructive to my own ways of thinking. Now, scholarship on tribal political economy pushed back against assumptions about indigenous communities and cultures that contrasted, typically contrasted, so termed traditional values as communal 
uh, and cooperative against the individualistic and competitive values associated with Western societies and their political economies. This thread, the one I'm just describing, emphasized agency and adaptation. It ultimately spawned a rather different, right, although related set of conversations, settler colonial studies that centers expropriation and marginalization, tracing both the production of poverty and the cultural discourses that support it to the replacement of indigenous populations with settlers, a phenomenon that includes and indeed relies upon a discursive shift that situates and recasts settlers as indigenous in the historical narrative. This recasting settlers as indigenous is really important to Oklahoma. It's an important part of the conversation, sort of what Oklahoma means and Oklahoman means in this context is deeply contested. And this produces an uneasy balance in scholarship between highlighting or ignoring indigenous agency against the immense power of colonialism as an instrument of dispossession. As scholar Vera Parham noted in many histories of Native Americans, it seems that the original inhabitants have become obscured in the national mythology of colonization. People who do not fit into the liberal capitalist notion of individualism and economic development simply vanish from the annals of history. Even histories focused specifically on Native Americans cover relatively little of Indian responses to capitalism. So let's come back to Oklahoma. Over the same decades that I'm tracing generally with regard to um, developments in scholarship, Indian economies, tribal economies have expanded dramatically, if unevenly, no more so than here in Oklahoma. This is a economic impact report produced by that group I mentioned, United for Oklahomans, which is a co coalition, a consortium of tribal nations here in Oklahoma. Tribal enterprises injected 16, nearly $16 billion into the state economy and generated more than 113,000 jobs paying $5.4 billion in wages. The direct return to the state coffers by virtue of game, what is more the direct return to state coffers by virtue of gaming contracts which we might regard as revenue share, sharing in lieu of taxation reaches into the hundreds of millions of dollars in addition to this so the direct payments from the tribal nations from gaming revenues to the state government is in the hundreds of millions of dollars Brian, Did, yeah um there's a couple uh, comments on the in the chat okay. but oh there we go the first first question that comes to my mind is whether or not the tribal nations in their uh, pursuit of of economic development have they developed a system of commercial law that's distinguished from the american commercial law yeah and, and, and if so in what respects is that distinction uh, important? Yeah, well, they are. They're developing um, their own forms of kind of uniform commercial code, if that's what you're describing, right? Things of that sort, commercial law, and it is distinguished. They're they're all, they're distinguished, I think, in part or in large measure because of the role of the nation itself, right? The nation itself, uh, and and so much of tribal economic activity or tribal business has to do uh, runs through the nation itself so the real trick here has to do with both promoting and regularizing commercial law within the context of a kind of a, a, a preeminent place for the tribes so as an the best example and we'll talk i'll show you some other things later tribal enterprises are i mean the things like uh, gaming casinos are not private businesses. They are instruments of the national government. And things that they fund sometimes are instruments of the national of, of the tribal government and sometimes they are private uh, businesses. So some of the commercial code has to reckon with that. Another has to reckon with the question of um, the land held in trust as generally speaking, not um, um, a, not, not ineligible, not able to be used as collateral for loans. So generating investment income 
is complicated again because it goes through the tribe. So does that does that work for you? Yeah, I think so. I, um, uh, we have a question or comment from Giannis. Uh, he has to be unmuted. Andrada, I guess you'll have to unmute him. Okay. Giannis. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my question is, who pays for the investment, like the capital development, as we would call it, and the maintenance and all that? Who foots that bill? And how does that bill compare with the turnover, like the, the revenue, like the gambling revenue? So who pays for the, the, like, like the, the building of the casinos? That's one component that the development cost. Right. And then the second component is who pays for the infrastructure, the road. Oh, yeah. 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 So the, infra the infrastructure is, is paid for by the tribes and sometimes in combination with the state and other investors. So um, it runs, but generally runs through the tribes. So, so, so the national government pays, but the tribes collect. No, the national government doesn't pay. The national government pays for some things, but the tribe generates its own funds. Okay, I would be interested to look. They generate their funds principally. They, gener they generate funds principally through gaming. A related, a related question occurs to me, Brian, and that is when the tribe funds construction of roadways across tribal lands, are they able to charge tolls for the use of those roadways? Well, I they are, so far as I'm aware, they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And whether they are allowed to, I think, would have to be litigated. I'm not sure they can right now, but uh, but that would be litigated, but they tend not to. In fact, the strategy is the opposite. So the strategy for tribes, at least in Oklahoma, is to build infrastructure that everyone uses and not charge tolls. By contrast, the state does charge tolls, right? On turnpikes and things of that sort. And the tribe tries to tries to do that. Well, as they want to facilitate traffic to the casino, Giannis, but also they are, um, dem there's a sort of a larger political and, and uh, economic agenda here where they want to um, demonstrate that they are good citizens uh, and contributors to all things Oklahoma. So they make a real point that the infrastructure that they build is used is used by everybody. As an example, during the uh, COVID, early days of COVID, it was the tribes that were by far ahead of the state in making uh, vaccinations available, firstly to their tribal citizens and then to anyone. And so they are actually engaged in a much larger, I think a longer kind of game here that positions them as not, that positions the casinos or positions the nations, nations not as a competitor to the state, but as a contributor to the state. Very good. Okay, go ahead. Anything else? No, okay. we're, we're caught up. Okay, good. And yeah, please feel free. Uh, and thank you for for reminding me or, or for, for for catching that. So, and this is actually kind of an interesting point that follows just what we we're describing. So those mandated contributions. So they are not tax. It's it's uh, revenue sharing in lieu of taxation from the casinos. Those contributions that are a consequence of gaming compacts coincide in Oklahoma with more than 15 years of tax cuts enacted by the state legislature and signed by successive governments. It is no stretch to conclude that the tribes effectively subsidize those tax cuts through gaming revenues and the, and the revenue sharing that they provide. So this again sort of tells you a little bit more about how these economies intersect. The nations are builders of infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools, entertainment districts. Let me get here. Including this place, Vibrant Riverwalk Complex, which was a bankrupt business venture in Jenks, the city of Jenks, which is across the Arkansas River from Tulsa, 
They purchased it for $11.5 million, the Creek Nation did, from the city of Jenks. It was bankrupt. There was exactly one business that was functioning there and soon remade and transformed it into a showcase entertainment and business district or the just announced right entertainment complex to be located in Stillwater, where I work, or uh, the uh, Chickasaw Nation funded the new baseball park in Oklahoma City and saw through the completion of a really spectacular First Nations me museum and did so, this is in Oklahoma City, did so when the state reneged on its promised financial support. So the state promised to build this musician, mu mu uh, museum, pulled out, the Chickasaw Nation came in and finished it. The museum is open to anybody. Tribes run state parks, some of which have been shifted to the na nations away from the state for upkeep keep and maintenance, even as our governor is embroiled in a controversy about a sweetheart deal with a shady restaurant concern to manage facilities like that. And this doesn't even begin to consider multiple and multiplying benefits generated by tribally run healthcare, housing, social assistance, daycare, athletics, as tribe delivers social services as effectively or demonstrating that they are fully functioning governments. Most recently, a defunct cancer treatment hospital was purchased by the Muskogee Creek Nation and is now running uh, in a different capacity now. Nations build their own capacity by increasingly diversifying their economies. In many cases, gaming generates investment capital for other purposes. And you, as you can see, and I'm not gonna talk about these, just a set of slides that are indicating this. Miami Nation of Nation Enterprise, I've got a portfolio of companies. Wichita Tribal Enterprises, these are just available, you can see them anywhere. Oklahoma Tribal Finance Consortium, American Indian Chamber of Commerce, Oklahoma. Citizen Potawatomi Nation running bank, banking and finance. And I think it, and it extends interestingly to cultural issues too. Oseo, Voices of the Cherokee Nation is an Emmy Award winning television pro, uh, series here in Oklahoma. It's actually, it's quite great. And it not only presents stories, but it also generates income and is a way to, um, uh, to further sort of filmmaking and television making capacity for young people particularly. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, step back a little bit because I just talked about things that are happening today. But as it turns out, journalists, lawyers, bankers, policymakers, and politicians produced a body of work in the 1880s, 1980s and 1990s. Among these, a 1986 article, Atlantic Magazine, focused mainly on how tribes in the state of Maine leveraged the land claims settlement to finance enterprises and investments from drag and cement plant to shape cassette tapes. We still, that's when we still made cassette tapes at a blueberry farm. This was a New York Times uh, article that I grabbed from that point, And it was documented the moment the Passamaquoddy tribe sold drag and cement, which, had, which was moribund, sold it at a profit. An interesting book called Tribal Assets, written by a journalist by the name of Robert White, and a special issue of the National Forum of All Things, the Phi, uh, Alpha Phi Honorary Society Journal, recounted the development of tribal enterprises in the context of the Reagan administration's efforts to shift policy away from federal programs, job training, and top-down economic developments, perhaps termed, we might describe as risk redistribution, toward encouraging and promoting varieties of local entrepreneurialism that reflected the Reagan administration's ideological positioning. And these are really interesting sort of ju juxtaposition here. On the one hand, Reagan great, praising Reagan's sort of new statement uh, of wanting to, to essentially leverage tribes trust status into an instrument for economic development and the other side of it at the same time james watt talking about uh, describing tribes as examples of failed socialism so the reagan administration sort of there's a lot going on there but among the things they did is they they were uh, harshly critical of government programs job programs economic development programs and then as a re and in fact cut the bureau of indian affairs budget by a significant percentage and as a consequence, in the other direction, they encourage tribes to begin to leverage their particular constitutional position as a way to generate economic development, businesses, and things of that sort. So there's both 
going two things going on here. So two things are interesting about these conversations from the 80s. First, they spoke mainly about tribally sponsored entrepreneurial activities like the Mississippi Choctaw Automotive Wiring Harness Enterprise, which worked with the Chrysler Company for a long time. And second, and this re reflects sort of the question that I received and kind of where we're going, they defined tribal assets as including their trust status, exemptions, possibly anyway from state contracting, and in some cases, the delivery of settlement funds and other legal actions. These were characterized as untapped potential business opportunities, hinting at the idea, right, that underneath cultural differences beats the heart of capitalism, I guess, in a sense, this isn't so different from older discourses. Equally interesting is a statement quoted in that book, Tribal Assets, that I just showed you, attributed to a Navajo gentleman. Responding to journalist White's question about cult, the cultural implications of economic change, cultural implications, he said memorably, traditional Navajo values don't include poverty. At the time, this struck me as a really interesting critique of external characterization, characterizations of native values and potentials then perhaps more more than a than, than maybe a more of a uh, than, than perhaps more of a then perhaps more of a, a more a more nefarious excursion into sort of emerging economic neoliberalism as intriguing as marjane ambler a piece on the left here her discussion of mining on reservations that coupled an appreciation for the history of exploitation and environmental damage or acknowledgement of them with a stout defense of the capacity of tribes to make decisions for themselves. Decrying journalistic excursions to Indian country in search of sad stories of the plight of American Indians, which is still true today. And we might even think about this, right? Famous uh, ad. Ambler emphasized the full humanity of tribal citizens and governments amidst a generalized discourse that treated them as children. Across the nation, Ambler writes, tribes gradually now are finding ways to make economic progress fit into their own value systems, rejecting the proposition common among some non-Indians that having jobs necessarily necessitates rejecting their culture. In concluding, she writes, too often, non-Indians automatically reject the idea of oil wells, factories, or bingo parlors on Indian reservations. They assume that when such development occurs, traditions vanish. This is a contested conversation. Vine Deloria Jr., the famous native activist, took a very different uh, um, uh, uh, topic on this, right? A different approach to this and was deeply concerned about uh, cultural atrophy in the context of economic development. The famous author, Gerald Visner, uh, famously predicted a backlash that a backlash against gaming would then undermine sovereignty more generally. He was not wrong, right? This is the ongoing court cases. And then there's the specter of abuse and fraud and stereotyping, as in the famous Jack Abramoff lob lobbying scandal that implicated Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho leadership and shady payoffs that Abram Abramoff described in shockingly racist terms. And you can see the terms he used for his so-called clients, right? His so-called clients. So what does this mean? Landscape has changed for Indian nations. And in Oklahoma, reshaped by McGirt. Recall the governor and his supporters clearly perceived, perceived political benefit from bashing tribes by scaring voters with what can be seen as a very Oklahoma version of replacement theory. On the other hand, what seems like a replay of past battles masks an emerging set of dynamics that show change circumstances. This is a consequence of gaming and the revenues of gaming to be certain, but also the intentional and sophisticated ways tribal nations have diversified their economic portfolios to become players in the state's economy and governance, whether Stitt likes it or not. Moreover, the, perf the performance of tribal nations as responsible governments capable of managing complex enterprises speaks volumes, as do does evidence that tribal nations build infrastructure for everyone, not just tribal citizens, a point they skillfully make, I would argue, through very sophisticated media operations, skillfully make that point. 
As tribal nations build their economic capacity and political influence, which support one another, they face backlash. It is a truism, right, that constituted power abhors competition, the United States, maybe other settler colonial societies, the existence of and prospects for indigenous nations are threatening, given the legal and constitutional position of tribal nations themselves, of tribal sovereignty, in other words. Through history, the individual states in the United States have been hostile to tribal sovereignty and are often joined in this effort, these efforts by extractive industries, ranching and farming industries, financial sectors, and indeed the non-Indian gaming industry. Though the federal government is theoretically bound to shield tribal nations from state incursion, its record, McGirt notwithstanding, is an encouraging. Sovereignty is both the tribe's strongest asset and its most attractive target. You diminish it in one place and it's weak, weaker across the board. State and industry-led assaults on tribal sovereignty are with us. Oklahoma, the state, has led or endorsed dozens of efforts to weaken or overturn McGirt. Most have failed. But in 2022, the Supreme Court in Oklahoma versus Castro Huerta weakened its own McGirt decision just two years earlier by endorsing the state's proposition that it has jurisdiction over crimes committed in Indian country by a non-Indian or non-citizen of a tribal nation. This shift earned a stinging dissent from Justice Gorsuch, who was the um, the architect of uh, McGirt, who wrote that truly a more ahistorical and mistaken statement of Indian law would be hard to fathom. Tribes are not private organizations within state boundaries. Their reservations are not glorified private campgrounds. Tribes are sovereign. A far more consequential assault on sovereignty came from a seemingly unrelated place. In its most recent term, the Supreme Court heard arguments in Holland versus Brackeen. At issue was the 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act, a landmark law designed to address abuses of adoption laws that led to the removal of thousands of Native children from their home communities. This act rests on the proposition that communities have a stake in the welfare of their children collectively and in the survival of their cultures. It also followed settled constitutional precedent defining membership in tribal communities as a political rather than a racial designation, meaning that citizenship is a function of tribal sovereignty, not necessarily blood. Plaintiffs in this case argued the opposite. Tribal membership is a racial category. And with that, and under that meaning, the Indian Child Welfare Act is an unlawful an unconstitutional race, racial preference that injures those seeking to adopt native children simply for racial reasons. In other words, is racially discriminatory. It is important to note that the complaint, the, 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 the complaint was supported by interest groups with a history of litigating tribal sovereignty as it, as it applies specifically to tribal control of natural resources and by well-heeled opponents of tribal gaming enterprise. And this led indigenous lawyers and activists to conclude that the real target was tribal sovereignty with the fate of adoption as a decidedly secondary issue, a way to encourage the court to diminish sovereignty by focusing on this particular issue. I can say that tribal leaders expected the worst, but were surprised, shocked even, when the court upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act in 2023. It was a stunning victory for tribal sovereignty that settled everything and nothing. Last couple of things, then I'll, I'll open up the, the, the question. So scholarship is likewise unsettled. As I've suggested, the topic of tribal enterprise and tribal capitalism is deeply contested and often shaped about how we view indigenous economic activity in the context of culture and, and, and larger societal concerns. As an example, I'll just draw your attention very quickly to these two books among many, Indigenous Economics by Ronald Trosper and Reservation Capitalism, one of several works on this topic by Robert Miller. Miller's a citizen of the Shawnee tribe, and he contests the very idea that indigenous values and capitalism are fundamentally at odds. And this is one of these right ongoing conversations. 
based basing his argument on a rereading of indigenous na notions of enterprise and individuality and private property, he asks us to consider tribal assets as including the constitutional position of tribes, advocates negotiating sovereign immunity, the creation of commercial codes, something we talked about a minute ago, and other adjustments that would ease tribal investment in outside businesses and promote private sector businesses on reservations. Really critical piece of information. Trosper, also an indigenous scholar, offers a divergent take on the past and future of indigenous economics. Taking no aim at the notion of sustainable development, he seeks to outline a pathway that's deeply root rooted in indigenous values of reciprocity and relationship and consensus building decision making. Development, he argues, is a Western concept that ignores the possibility of sustainable societies operating outside and, and uh, in opposition to individualism and capitalism. Like Miller, he recognizes the aboriginal roots of private property, but his focus is on a kind of relational economy that privileges balance between humans, non-human animals, and so termed inanimate objects. To a degree, I am unconvinced by both arguments even as they both have something to offer. Unlike Miller, I'm wary of private uh, investment if it comes at the cost of sovereignty. Likewise, Trosper's analysis of contemporary applications of relational economies is less persuasive. Perhaps more interesting, though, is the way both scholars kind of think deeply and at times recreate older discussions of the nature, history, and principles of indigenous economic activity. And you might even say, the nature of indigenous behavior generally. I'm not sure where that conversation is going, but I want to suggest that what we see in indigenous economic activity today tracks closely about how we think about indigenous peoples in relation to capitalism. It may be that we see what we want to see, in which case discussions of indigenous economics and tribal capitalism are less about native people than they are about other things. There's a long history of using indigenous cultures to make points about our world, whatever, wherever in history we may find ourselves. And this is an ongoing conundrum. Where are native people in this? This is a great book, by the way, on McGirt. I'd suggest a simple proposition that also has a demonstration. How about we ask tribal citizens and governments what they think? how they assess economic development, sovereignty, capitalism, and the survival of indigenous communities in the context of other relationships with states and nationhoods and non-native peoples. Tribal people live in this world, not an imaginary one. Having battled forces bent upon their destruction as distinctive cultures, communities, peoples, and nations, they are keenly aware of the multiple trade-offs that require building sustainable economies while also recognizing holding fast to tribal nationhood is distinctive and indigenous, where tribal peoples participate in market economies as laborers, investors, and business owners, but in ways that respect their agency, respect their history, and their capacity with making these kinds of balances. I would argue that one of the big outcomes of the McGirt decision upon economics in Oklahoma and conversations is precisely this, at the discursive level, where Indian nations are not only economic players, but they have developed the capacity to engage meaningfully in those conversations about the nature of tribal government, its relationship to state governments. And it is truly, right, a far more reciprocal conversation than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Oh, and whatever happened to Hooper? Well, in 2023, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals decided the case and the city of Tulsa lost. Hooper won, so reversed it. But in a repeat of the same story, tribes now accuse the city and state of failing to honor this ruling by continuing to arrest and charge charging tribal members for violations of municipal ordinance inside Indian country. And with that, I thank you for listening. And I look forward to a conversation. I will do my best to answer questions if I can. Brian, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've I've certainly learned a lot about the issues that are that are now boiling to the surface, and it's been there for perhaps a very long time. That 
a lot of us just simply don't simply learn about in uh, you know our studies or ever everyday news, particularly those of us who live on the eastern coast and not in a in a part of the country where the tribal tribal nations ha are a significant portion of the local economy. I have a couple thoughts and questions, but I will yield to those who have their hand up. And the first one I see is Marty Rowland, who is a member of the school's faculty and a trustee of the school. I'm sure he has something to throw at you that'll be challenging. I'm sure. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, Ed. Uh, really good job of uh, getting the, the speaker to speak. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Brian for uh, bringing all this information. I think uh, uh, on one level, it's kind of like overwhelming but overwhelming in a good sense because it's bringing to light things that I don't think we've thought a whole lot about. But one of the things that uh, uh, interests me is the um, the ability of the tribes to act in a, a cooperative fashion uh, as a body uh, because it really brings to mind the, the, the science of political economy the way that Henry George uh, stressed it. Uh, he was really critical of the of the way that uh, so-called economics was uh, devol well evolving into the 20th century, and uh, it seemed as though that um, that uh, there was uh, a lot of wealth being created. You're talking about a lot of examples where failed businesses were taken over by tribes, and they figured out a way of making it profitable. Um, I guess I would like to just pose the idea that maybe when we talk about this, uh, that we go away from the, the, you know, what does this mean for capitalism? Because capitalism is inherently uh, focused on uh, individualism, but be uh, more mindful of political economy because that in itself is a, a cooperative uh, way of viewing government. Yeah, yeah, I th I'm I'm with you. I agree with yeah. you. So uh, I'm thinking that. Uh, um, well, maybe let me throw this out. You you're talking about sovereignty. Uh, do tribes have a uh, a level of sovereignty within the United States to do things, for example, to issue currency and have that be traded within the tribes? They. They may. I don't think they they typically haven't. Um, they do extend credit um, from, you know, sort of some tribal entities that may circulate in a not exactly like that, but in a in a fashion along yeah, those in, lines. In right. And, and, yeah. And I kind of they it might operate that way. Uh, issuing currency. I don't know, at least not in the 20th, 20th 21st century. I don't know uh, of an example of that. Well, bringing it to a uh, Henry George angle, do they look at uh, land value as a way of uh, financing? Or yeah, or... yeah, I think I think they do, and I think that if or put it this way, they see land uh, and resources as the such sort of the source, right, of 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 wealth and finance and the capacity to to generate wealth. I mean, I think added to that, right? I mean, what's what makes this a little bit intriguing? Is that you have the land and the resources, and what's, but there, but the resource includes, or the value of the land includes its constitutional status. So the fact that tribal land is held in trust for those communities by the federal government means that it is both there's both a relationship, kind of a a ward and uh, you know sort of relationship with the national government, but it also exempts or excludes tribal governments or tribal enterprise from regulation by the states. So we can think about trust status as having value, right, in that way. And in fact, I think in some ways, it's in many ways, the most valuable part, because the trust status is the is the instrument by which tribes can run casinos. Uh, casinos can own uh, gaming enterprises and other tribal enterprises operate on trust land physically which has them outside the regulatory structure, the tax structure uh, 
of the states. And so McGirt, in terms of criminal jurisdictions, building on that same concept, right, that that the land itself and the trust status is meaningful. And so these so trust lands are within the boundaries of a state, but they are not under state jurisdiction. So this is where, right, in some ways, real, where the, the key value comes, right, and that, this, that the tribes have this capacity to use their land base in a very different way outside the state. Brian? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Getting back to the, the money question, a couple of things that are, your, your response really pointed out to me. One is a question. Do the tribes actually uh, charter banks directly? Do they yes. are they do they have public banks or tribal banks? They do. And so the next follow up question is: Do they accept land value as collateral for borrowing? In other words, if yeah, they, they probably do. And and I, I'd have to think more about that. My guess is they would, but it wouldn't be tribally trust land. It would be land that are that belonging to individuals okay. that could be used in that capacity. So when we think about Indian nations and we see a boundary on a map, we need to remember that that's the sort of the, the extent of the tribal domain. But within that, there are multiple kinds of, of, uh, of legal um Types of multiple types of land holding. There's land that's held by the by the tribe. There's land that's held by individuals in trust with the tribe. There's also a lot of individually held land that's just regular property, right? And it's with, but it is also within the boundaries of the tribe. So one of the confusing things, right, is that there's not one mode of kind of uh, land tenure uh, operating inside these communities. This would certainly keep lawyers busy. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, now, uh, with regard to the issuance of money, uh, as I'm sure you know, across the United States, there are many local currency networks, mm -hmm. and those networks issue their own currency circulating within that community, often uh, uh, tied to some, e in, in many cases, either labor units or some kind of commodity like uh, firewood. Yeah, right, uh, right. Do you think that the tribes would be able to issue currency on that basis uh, to circulate within the economy? And and for many small communities, the argument for it, of course, is, well, this keeps purchasing power within the community mm -hmm. so that uh, people don't, the money that we spend at Walmart doesn't go to, you know, Walmart headquarters. Exactly. So I don't know about I'd have to really do some research and think about the money part of it, the currency part of it. <clears throat> I think that the basic principle of many tribal enterprises operates as you've described it. And the idea is to keep right the money in the community to maintain, have, have the resources circulate within the community as opposed to making their way outside. And this is one of the real, uh, the real basic principles for tribal enterprise is that these are tribal national ventures and because and the, and so in other words you don't have you know and, and so it's basically basically the same the a similar concept put it that way well uh, i don't see anyone else's yellow hand up and, and i don't want to dominate the conversation but i do have have issues that i i think are worth bringing up sure. uh, oh i see Giannis has has asked to join in so i'll let him take uh, preference over me great yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do these revenues, you, you said these are national, like tribal enterprises, how do the revenues get uh, get distributed? Is there a dividend per tribal member? Yeah, yeah. so they, so they operate, yeah, they operate differently. So there's a, a the particularly with gaming is the most regulated of tribal enterprises. So according to the federal legislation that governor, governs tribal gaming, the revenues are, are there's a formula that they are distributed. So a portion can be, a por the largest portion goes to funding tribal services, education, healthcare, tribal government, things like that. A portion of that can be uh, for, held out for investment income. And then many tribes also have dividends, right? They're called per capita payments but they will have a series of dividends that are in fact distributed to tribal members. That is a real contested issue. 
uh, and and is one that sort of back and forth and a lot of discussion about it. But all of those things operate. Smaller businesses might operate a little bit differently. But in one sense, we want to think about if if all of the revenue is generated as a consequence of the trust status of the land, right, then there's a mechanism where the funds are brought to the tribe and then distributed. Now, this is, doesn't have anything to do with wages. It doesn't have anything to do with with things like that. If you work for the casino, you make a wage. You make you you're paid, right? You're paid just like anybody. And in fact, Social Security taxes are taken out and all the rest of it, right? So it's so it's it's no different. But the revenues, right, have this other kind of instrument that's deeply intertwined with the relationship between tribal nations and the federal government that are often highly structured and highly regulated. So Joe, I see your question. I think you're right. They don't. I don't know. They would need local currency, right? They they can extend credit and operate right at that level. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a much more elegant solution. Yeah, um, it's something that has been advocated by people like Ellen Brown and uh, in Germany. Apparently, the banks have much more of a public component as well, which right. is more locally beneficial and so forth. Um, and I also like the notion of uh, the federal government keeping the land in trust. It's just too bad it's not that way. I, I think ultimately, ideally, George would have liked that for everybody. Oh, yeah. And we just rent the land and uh, we don't get to uh, extract any uh, economic rent. Right. Um, so it's, uh, those are two very good things. The one thing that disappoints me, and I see it over and over again, is that the uh that these communities uh, invest in uh, casinos, gaming. <laughs> yeah, like I'd love to see it invest in essential needs of the community. And I realize there's kind of a two-step two process here, but particularly if you've got public banks, uh, you know, um, they could fund um, that kind of direct investment to really enhance them themselves directly. Uh, well, that, I, does, that does I, take I feel, like there is that. Oh, oh. Well, I'm sure there is. It's just I, you know, Keynes talked about allocating resources, that that's what it's really all about. The money is just a facilitator. Right. And we only have so much land, labor and capital. Right. And I'd rather see us not invest in the in, in today's world, whether it's because of climate change or hopelessness or food banks or whatever. I'd like to see us allocate our scarce resources in more essential goods and services and not di divert some of those things in our considerable, uh, I would call them third tier uh, investments like yeah, gaming, I, like alcohol, like. Yeah, whatever. absolutely. And I, and I think that um, hmm. that's precisely a conversation that, takes place in tribal communities, took place at the onset of the gaming era and a lot of early on. And some Indian nations have have eschewed, right, have rejected gaming for essentially the argument that you're making. And the real challenge for Indian nations has been really generating capital, right, generating resources. And and as it turns out, the, um, uh, the casino apparatus has been by far uh, the most lucrative enterprise. But that doesn't mean that 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 uh, folks in Indian nations are are um, less uneasy about it than than you. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is an ongoing. I've got a good friend who's Osage, and he runs a um, such a graphic design and advertising firm. Really successful, super interesting guy. Um, and he, even though this apparatus has fueled what he's done, he's highly critical of it, and he objects to. Uh, the structure of the larger economy, as, as he says, argue uh, forcing Indian people into the world of vice, right? And that and right. the layers of vice and and objects to it. And he's not alone. And he's a younger guy. He's younger than I am. So that's not that's not, not that young. <laughs> but but um, but but I think it's it is a, it's a really vibrant conversation. And, and people are uh, indigenous people disagree, I think, pretty vehemently on this.
Uh, yep. The problem is that um, if you look at the pre-gaming world compared to now, um, and there and there's a lot of poverty in Indian country today, but there's a lot less than there was. And there are more language uh, uh, revitalization programs. There are more schools. I mean, here's another thing is that that the gaming revenue has really fostered cultural revitalization. These were programs that that tribes couldn't afford. And now they run them. And you have, you know, all you know, things along those lines. They do child care, um, you know, health care, as I was mentioning. So there's a lot they're doing but is a you know what is it it is a it's a devil's bargain right i mean that's yep. that's that's honest that's the honest truth right well it's also true that that many of us we humans have a predisposition to gambling uh i i i suspect that joe did not watch the uh nfl super bowl game last last <laughs> evening there's a lot of there was, a, there was a lot of gambling going on on yeah on on just about everything Yep. Uh, and, you know, I, from my reading of tribal societies, they're not immune to that, that they had in, in they had, the past. They had, they had, ga they had uh, games, game, uh, gambling games well before contact. Gambling existed. Yeah. As, as I've said uh, in other conversations, because of my limited exposure to the Oneida people in, in New York State, it seemed to me that they were using the revenue from the gambling casino to to buy their land back one parcel at a time. There's a lot of that. So, There's a lot of that buying buying their land back, which in and of itself is sort of an interesting thing to think about, right? And the, and buying the land back is complicated. So nations across the country are doing it because they're able to buy land back, but they have to apply and petition to the federal government to have that land brought into trust, yeah. as the word is, and that is fought tooth and nail by yeah. state and local governments who do not want that to happen. And so it's not, it's by, you know, by no means is that a given. Next. Thanks very much have, for this presentation. It's been quite good. Oh, I appreciate it. Question Thanks. from Michael Leroyd. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm speaking from London, England. Uh, we have to go a long, long way back to find our indigenous heritages, uh, but, it, but it is there if you go back far enough. And and I just raised a question in my mind. What your your talk uh, does does this preoccupation with indigenous peoples create too many separate identities? And oh, and, and, and that's one way. And then immigrants coming to a country like in England, we've had we're, we're full of immigrants actually, and, and they've been coming for a thousand years, you know, different ways, and, and, and with their unique traditions, and it changes that. Sh should we should we emphasise this separate identity, or does it create problems for a, a United Kingdom? Excuse my pun. In that in that sense, I mean, America is full of indigenous indigenous peoples but then full of immigrants bringing their separate identities so it creates a an interesting mix and how we resolve that in the 21st century i think is a a big problem thank you well the, the, the governor of our state would argue that these separate identities and particularly sovereignties are harmful and and he is an opponent of all of this um and so that's that's one opinion uh in oklahoma then there are many people who argue that it's there's not a problem at all and that particularly indigenous people so i would argue that indigenous peoples would probably object to linking their their situation with immigrants and the reason is well there are several reasons or historic reasons but also uh the different legal standing that tribes find themselves in. So they would argue, again, that this is not a race or an ethnic issue. This is an issue of sovereignties. This is an issue of citizenship. So, so the argument is there. Tribal citizens in Oklahoma are also Oklahoma citizens. They're also citizens of the United States. And so there are overlapping identities. And I think that how 
one imagines that playing out is a big, as you say, this is a big question for the 21st century and people disagree greatly. I think Oklahoma is a really interesting place because of the history of this state as built upon the dispossession of indigenous peoples at one time in the 19th century. Certainly prior to the 1880s, Oklahoma, what we call Oklahoma, was a series of contiguous tribal nations. And the process of statehood, of assembling and applying for the creation of Oklahoma, came at the expense of those sovereignties. And so non-Indians from a variety of backgrounds lobbied and pressured the federal government to undermine those sovereign nations that existed and had a government to government relationship. So part of that history really is, is an aspect of what we're talking about here. So it's partly ethnicity. It's partly this, it, it's also partly, it, there's certainly a cultural issue in play, but it's this, it's this deeper history of, of legal and indeed cultural sovereignty. And the tribes would say, or memory, I don't, I don't speak for them, but they would argue, you know, our forefathers negotiated treaties to reserve for future generations the existence of this entity and did mm -hmm. so at great cost, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's how it would be framed that when we talk about reservations, it's what's reserved, right? What was reserved? They said, we gave, we surrendered under duress property, land, certain level of freedom, and we hung on to this one thing. And so it's precious. So it's a little bit of a different thing, but I really appreciate your, you know, your larger framing because these are very much conflated. And like I said last week, in the state legislature, our governor, a member of the Cherokee Nation, accused the tribal leaders who were sitting there of engaging in racially divisive politics. You know, Brian, it's kind of, it's coincidental, totally coincidental, but I am just in the process of writing a paper based on a rereading of Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s Pulitzer Prize winning book on this whole subject. Yeah. Um, for those who've never read it, this should be required reading for any thoughtful person. He was a, he was a great writer. The, the title of the book is The Disuniting of America. And, mm -hmm. and he covers this all these issues in this book, the comparison of multiculturalism versus pluralism. Right. And it seems to me what Brian is, is explaining is that there is a legal treaty bound treaty sourced basis for multiculturalism with the first American nations. Yeah. But with the rest of us, there's no basis for that. We, we then are required to live in a pluralistic society where all ethnicities, all races, uh, all people with all different norms are urged to assimilate. And Schlesinger's views in the book uh, ring true today that, that it's assimilation doesn't mean giving up all of your cultural heritage. But it does mean that you think of yourself as members of the same nation, that we're, you're one people, we're all Americans. And, uh, and I think that that may be part of what the, first, the people of the first American nations are struggling with, uh, the, the balance are, between pluralism and multiculturalism. And they're also, they're also referencing a long and deep history where assimilation was used to break their communities. Yeah. Break their people and, and um, actually literally steal their people uh, and move them to boarding schools. So, so, and, and actually rob them of, of wealth. Um, you know, these assemble the, the drive for assimilation in native communities, which was particularly strong at the end of the 19th century, not surprisingly led to the loss of two thirds of the tribal land base. And that's two thirds that existed in 1890. It's way less than there was you know, that before that. And the is, this was couched, the allotment era was couched in precisely these terms. We all need to be Americans. We all need to be part of the same polity. Mm 
for tribal nations, it meant impoverishment. Yeah. And and that when their tribal entities were weakened, bankers, you know, other investors, squatters came onto their land and ended up with their property in the name of this sort of creation of a larger polity. So from their perspective, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? That might sound good. Uh, and I think that it's also important to to bear in mind that that Native people are proud Americans. Native peoples enlist in the armed forces at, in the highest percentage of any ethnic group in this country, any, the highest percentage. Uh, it, and that measures something. You can decide what it measures, but they are the highest percentage. And I think that that you know you're talking about those who are non-Indians have to contend with this notion of pluralism, living in a plural society. It's a really good point. I think indigenous peoples have to contend with it too, because yeah. because non-Indians can go through life, and 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 I talk to students about this can live one's life. A fairly, it could even be a successful life, maybe not fully enriched, without ever once thinking about or meeting an indigenous person. Your life just goes on, and never think about this. That is impossible for indigenous people because of their the size of the community and the power differential. That indigenous peoples must right respond to the majority cu culture every day, and and that's simply. That's not right. Members of the majority culture don't have to know a single thing about Indian people to live in this society. So, so I think the you know the question of pluralism cuts in all kinds of really fascinating ways. This is a really great conversation, um, and and I think really instructive for you know Schlesinger and kind of the where we are right now and thinking about you know what what this society is. Yeah, what I learned from Schlesinger, I mean. I don't have to go back too many generations in my own family heritage to find my great grandparents and, and even my grandparents as immigrants to this country. Right. And they came here because they perceived that life would be better here than it was in their, their country of origin. And, uh, and I don't know their stories very well. Because by the time I was born, my parents uh, had already become totally Americanized. Yeah, yeah. And even my grandfather, who who came from France, uh, did not teach his children, my my mother and her siblings, much if anything about France. My grandmother was from Belgium. My mother knew almost nothing about her family's history, where they came from, what they did, right. any of that. And and I, I from what I read, and even in Schlesinger's book, talked about talks about how quickly even people of, of Hispanic origin within one generation, uh the next generation can no longer speak the language. Right. And all of and and we're now in this this societal struggle of trying to reconnect people trying to reconnect with their heritage, find it again, resurrect it, and yet still feel like we're one people. And I and from you know from what you've taught us today, it just seems like there's just extra layers of that challenge with regard to the people of First Nations. Yeah, and I but I think they also interestingly enough, or maybe ironically enough, maybe demonstrate the capacity to do just that right and that, yeah. that uniquely because of their history and the small numbers of people but also the legal status and the co they're the attempt to and essentially the attempt to recreate these nations they're really they do live that what you're describing how to manage these multiple layers of meaning and identity it's really and it's really fascinating to watch and to think about um just in all kinds in all kinds of ways you know i mean go to a go to a, uh, an Oklahoma Thunder basketball game and there's like a pretty significant native presence there, but it's about Oklahoma, you know? And, and, and so it, you know, human beings are, are complex animals. Not only complex, but we frequently contradict ourselves. Utterly. In our, 
Yeah, Utterly, I, I tell my students, I'm going to have to run here in a minute, guys, but I, I tell my students, you know, when we're studying history is that the thing they have to do is embrace paradox. You've got to embrace paradox or you're not going to get anywhere with this stuff. <laughs> well, Brian, thank you so much for spending time with us. This is wonderful. Uh, I really, really valued it. Well, uh, I, we, we hope that the Henry George School will, will uh, have an opportunity to have this conversation with you again and give us an update. Right. Uh, right. And maybe you can uh, give us some more lessons on what we ought to know about the lives and the history of the people who were here before most of us. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Love it. Good Take night. Care, everybody. Thank you for coming. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming to this uh uh, enlightening discussion with with Brian and uh, I don't know what's on the next uh, what's next on the agenda for the school but uh, I'm sure that you'll hear from Ibrahim Adram uh, who couldn't be here tonight because he has some personal affairs to take care of and I was happy to sit in for him so thank you everyone and good night good night everybody thank you again <laughs>